Good evening, everybody. And thank you for joining us this evening and thanks for your time. We know it's really precious. You'll be joining France, Leanne, Rashika and myself, Linda, as we engage you this evening on topics that are close to your heart. I'd imagine they're close to your heart or you probably wouldn't be online. The story of one's life could be seen upon reflection as a haphazard sequence of events, paradoxically, some more noteworthy than others. The people, situations or events that taught us lessons that have stood the test of time are often the ones that were most painfully felt or learnt at their origins. Life's lessons can be utilized to grow us or can flit away ephemerally like dust in the wind. A place of learning like ours is one that aims to capture those lessons, to hold on to the learnings that help us navigate the, the many complexities of adult life and to shun those things that hold us back or stand in the way of our success, whatever success may mean to you. Learning at institutions like Henley should, amongst other things, be relevant, they should be real, learning should be social, and learning should be thought-provoking. Or the lessons will stay for a while, but very soon exit stage left and move on. As adults, we learn best when we see the relevance of something to our lives. If I'm a pilot, I need to know everything there is to know about the instruments that keep us in the air. And I need to remain constantly abreast of all the safety mechanisms and processes that will allow me as the pilot to, re to react in the correct way should something unforeseen arise. I may not pay such careful attention to lessons on a topic that would not add to my toolkit. We learn best when we see something as relevant. That's my first point. Secondly, the Navy uses a simulator to teach vital lessons before its cadets are allowed to be part of the real thing. Learning needs to be as close to whatever that real thing is, as is feasible. A textbook can show us wonderful theories and teach us of instances when people learnt a new skill or managed a situation that was new to them. This, however, is a few steps removed from our reality. We learn best by doing and by repeating the doing and then reflecting on the repetition of the doing. It's when we fumble and have to start over or are led to think of a different way of doing that we really commit the new pathways to memory and can draw on them when we're needing them in the future. I'm sure you can recall some of the harder things you've learned. They're often the ones that really tripped you up or made you incredibly uncomfortable for a while. We learn too, thirdly, as we engage with others socially. Collective minds often give rise to new thoughts, as you will have seen in teams that work well together. Really understanding another's perspective is critical to personal and business growth and collaboration. And we need other people in order to understand their perspectives. We often have the mirror shown to us by others as we react to behaviors we don't like in ourselves. Learning socially helps us navigate our daily work lives. Very few of us work entirely alone. And lastly, when we engage our brains, i.e. when we provoke our thoughts, we create new neural pathways that allow us to broaden our thinking and to make better sense of our surroundings in order to make good solid decisions and to take effective and efficient action based on these decisions in our organizations and oft times in our homes. Why am I saying all of this? Well, because at Henley, we understand a bit about learning and we constantly engage in debate about what works well and what we should stop doing as it no longer serves our audience or our changing landscapes. In this hour of the time you've afforded us, and thank you for that, we aim to give you a taste of the way we like to do things around here at Henley Business School, Johannesburg, Henley, Africa to invite you into our world for a while and entice you to take up the learning baton once again, or possibly for the first time. Franz van der Kolf will be engaging you in the art of storytelling, of which he is a master. As I mentioned at the outset, it's very often through lived experience or stories upon which we reflect that we construct our reality and decide what to use or decide what to lose moving forward. Leanne Naidu will pick up the baton to show how these stories, anecdotes, or experiences aid us in our thinking practices. 
and Raisha Kapadaras will pull it all together and engage you and the rest of us in the Q&A process. France and Leanne are adjunct faculty members at Henley and Rashika runs our open undergrad division. I head up executive education and learning experience at Henley. Please sit back and enjoy what is left of the 60 minutes. Over to you, France. Thank you, Linda. Um, and as Linda said, we learn and we understand learning at Henley and that is where we we give people the information and often through stories. I think it's very important that we understand that the story is such an important part of the African history and that the story is such a great way of learning. The story is very powerful and throughout the history of Africa, the story has been used to pass on cultural and philosophical beliefs about Africa and about the people of Africa. I would like to just share with you a little bit, if we go back into the history, the history that we should be grounding ourselves in, and this, this essentially is Henley Africa, and therefore it is about learning in Africa and learning that is applicable to the continent of Africa. And that's where the story becomes so important. If you look at our history and we go way back, you will see that throughout, the kingdoms and the civilizations of Africa, and we talk about kingdoms like Aksum, we talk about even earlier the kingdom of Kush and, uh, and our, our famous goddess of Isis in Aksum, it was the queen of Sheba. And then later on, we look even much closer at the kingdom of Zimbabwe, but throughout all of this, it was about wisdom. That was what it was all about. It was about learning, it was about wisdom, and it was about productivity. And this is contrary to the later beliefs because when um, people came to this continent, many could simply not accept that there was this rich history. And of course, it's always the history was told in, in the written form, which is different to what we had more in the oral form before. So if you look at, if we go back to, to Timbuktu in Mali, where, where um, we had the great Mansa Musa, he would have stood out for wanting all his people in the kingdom to be knowledgeable. That was his big thing. He brought wise people from all over to come and talk to the people of Timbuktu. There were even libraries built there. And it was about people being able to go down the street, people being able to learn. But more than the, the manuscripts they had there, and, and it's the fascinating story of Ahmed Baba, when they asked him, how many manuscripts do you have, sir? He said, well, I have a very, very small library. And he was based in Timbuktu. I only have 1,600 manuscripts. And this was in the 1300s. So that is the history of our continent that we so often neglect. And that is the history that we need to look at. But that is all through, came up to us all through storytelling. And, and I think, it is so important that we remember that it was the wise people in the villages that told the stories and the elders. And of course, mostly it would have been the grandmothers. The grandmothers would sit in the evenings and there would be children around and there would be grown ups around and the, the grandmothers would share the history. And as I said, the beliefs of and the culture of, of, of the tribes through storytelling and people were engrossed in those. And that's why we need to bring, have to bring more of the storytelling into today's ways of teaching and sharing knowledge. Because as I say, it is applicable and it is relevant to our continent. And we need to do a lot more of that. So it was also believed in, in, in our, in our um, in our history and the history of Africa that nobody was ever born bad. You were born good. But that your ancestors and your elders had to set the example. And they had to set the good example. And if they set a bad example, it was then that somebody picked up bad habits. And that's why the role of the elders, the role of the teachers, the role of the educators are so incredibly important because they set the good example. They give you the good information that will lead to your good life. And that is why 
the education and the process that we followed Hindley is so important because it is about the good education. It is about the good example. It is about giving you the right information for you to then be able to run your business properly or do what you have to do, what you're doing at the end of the day better. And, and it is all, as I say, through the story. So I want to share with you, there was a tribe living and there's still some of them left, but they were, they were really a, a very prominent tribe about a thousand, just more than a thousand years ago. They were at the height of, 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 of their civilization and, and they were called the Dogon tribe. They lived in West Africa and again in that area of Mali where we discussed Mansa Musa and where he was so good at, at providing knowledge for his people and, and believed so much in wisdom. But this wisdom thing runs throughout the history of our continent. And, and um, the Dogon tribe believed that you should be very good at what you do. They believe that you should really work and concentrate exceptionally hard on the job at hand. And that job, of course, in those days would have been um, either agriculture, it could have been some form of art, it could have been being in the village tending to the children of the village, because again, as we know about the African villages. It took a village to raise the children. So some people had the job of raising all the children and looking after them and making sure that they were picking up the good habits that we were talking about earlier on. Because remember, nobody was born bad and still today similarly so. So in the Dogon tribe, you had to be good at the job you did because that was good for the village. And we all contributed to the good of the village at the end of the day. But then they believed, secondly, after you were good at the job you did, you had to be exceptionally good, equally so as in your job, at the relationships you had and being friends and, and with the people that you were close to. So we had to work hard at relationships because they believe that if you didn't have good relationships with your family, with the people around you, you would never be able to do your job well. And that was an important part. And then thirdly, they believed that as important as relationships and doing your job well, you had to work very hard at yourself. That was getting information, learning new things, enriching your life. Because if you didn't enrich your life, if you didn't make yourself better, you would not be able to be good at the relationships and then at the job that you're doing. So those three, three things had to be in balance. But then they said, no, 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 wait. There's a fourth thing. To be able to be good at your job, to be able to be good at the relationships, to be able to enrich yourself, there's a fourth thing that's very important, equally important to the others. And that is that you had to get a very good rest every day. So you had to sleep well, you had to rest well, because without the rest, you could not do any of the other things. So this is the Dogon tribe on the African continent 1500 years ago. And you would say, how do I know all of this? Well, it's been passed down to us through the story. Eh? Through storytelling, we know this. That is how it came down to today's generations. But this, balanced lifetime was developed on the African continent a thousand years ago. Today we are writing books about it. Today we are studying it at universities. And this leads me to the point that we have the storytelling on the African continent. We have the wisdom of, the, of, of Mansa Musa and Queen of Sheba and the goddess of I, Isis and the Dogon tribe. But of course, we need to take this story and we need to take the storytelling and we need to then translate it into theory and that's where Leanne comes in and Leanne I would like to introduce you next to take this further and to give us some of the theories that back up the stories and thank you for that and thanks for listening to me. Thank you so much Franz and while you're still with me can I just check that you can see my slides okay? I can indeed excellent they look beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Franz. 
So Linda talks about learning being relevant. Linda talks about learning being as close to reality as possible. That learning is best delivered through social practices, but at the same time needs to be thought provoking in order for people to make sense of it. Franz, you're talking about how learning has been imparted across our continent over numerous centuries, actually, and storytelling being such an effective tool to be able to convey learning. I want to boil it down to one of the most important concepts within a learning environment, and that is around thinking. Whether we're talking about Nancy Klein's work on taking the time to think, whether we think about Daniel Kahneman's work on two systems of thinking, whichever model and framework we consider as the context for why thinking is important, we've got to recognize why people think. And one of the key things that stands out for me from a Henley Business School perspective, despite the programs that we, we execute on, despite the levels of seniority of people who come through our doors to be able to be part of a facilitated learning environment, there are key reasons as to the tools that we are imparting. And one of the most important tools that I think prefaces the learning environment are the tools we impart around thinking. So if we look at the, the purple bubbles here, whether we are compiling information to be able to organize it in a way that we can connect information, or whether we are focusing on information that allows us to analyze this information such that we can generate new ideas, there are many reasons as to why thinking becomes important. Another interesting trait within a Henley environment is recognizing that people are different. People have different styles of thinking. So you might be a detailed thinking person. You might be an expert in your field, um, an expert in diving deep into detail, wanting to derive insights. You might be an optimizer of processes and operations such that you want to improve productivity. You might also be a detailed thinker in the space of producing new ideas and driving momentum within your teams. Or you could also be a coach who is relationship oriented and needing to strike authentic relationships. You may also be in these fields wanting to learn new tools and techniques around thinking and how you can be more effective or you could also think about developing your big picture thinking skills. In other words, becoming the explorer, someone who generates creative ideas or a planner thinking about effective systems, thinking about energizing people into action and or being a connector who strengthens relationships. So what's important to note here is that we recognize diversity. In fact, we encourage it and irrespective of your starting position on this journey in developing you to your fullest potential, we'll work with you to be able to come up with tools and techniques that suit your context, that challenge you and stretch you, and that build you into being a better version of yourself, if you wish, because it could be scary too. Now, I remember if somebody had to tell me about solving this problem, I would get really excited about it and find my path between A and B and it would take me a couple of minutes and I would do it in pencil, of course, because I would want to erase the parts when I got it wrong, right? But then I realized that I needed to change the rules and I needed to apply different levels of thinking. And this little diagram that I'm sharing with you will give you some context into how to break the rules and how to think differently. Linked to this are other tools and techniques that you can use. And I want to talk about systems thinking and how systems thinking plays out in the underpinnings of a variety of programs that we deliver at Henley to be able to strengthen management capability and indeed build confidence in future leaders. Now, if you look at the two pictures on screen, you might look at it in a literal sense as disconnected dots or a part of a jigsaw puzzle. However, once you are exposed to systems thinking tools, you will get to see the interconnectedness of the dots. You'll get to see that the jigsaw puzzle piece is part of a bigger picture. 
But most importantly, as you join the dots and as you complete the picture, it's important for you to recognize that there could be different patterns in how you choose to complete the picture. And those patterns are entirely dependent on you. At the same time, as you learn systems thinking tools, it would be easy for you to apply linear thinking and not see the circular references or the need for you to reflect on some of the decisions and assumptions that you've made. You might choose to deep dive into disparate points of data and not see and synthesize the whole in its entirety. Consequently, you may classify and cluster information in silos and show no emergence of new ideas. And you might look at something in isolation without sensing the relationships in there. All of these concepts linking back to what Linda and Franz have shared with you so far. Imagine leaving a program with more than just short-term memory of a subject, but having a lifelong skill of how you can think differently, understand systems in which problems exist, and apply creative problem-solving techniques to some of life and the world's most complex problems. Imagine what your life would be like then. Imagine what would happen if as you plan your life and anticipate where you think you will end up in future, classic graph that you're looking at on screen, progress over time, my life is predictable if I were to take these steps on the dotted line. But what if life happens and brings a whole lot of disruption to you? Would that be a surprise to you? Or would that actually be something that you would see as an exponential growth surprise factor? What's the possibility of you ending up somewhere better, greater than you had originally planned and initially envisaged? What would your life be like then? You see, with COVID being the way that it is, with lockdown and the challenges that we're experiencing, the fourth industrial revolution, think tanks that I'm involved in, planning for the fifth industrial revolution, having visited Huawei in China less than 18 months ago, 5G is old news. 5G is old news. We were exposed to thoughts around 6G, 7G, 8G, and I hate to admit this, but I couldn't fathom what 9G and 10G actually means for us as a society. More exciting than that is the anticipation that 10G will reach me in my lifetime. I am of course going to live to 150 years old, but just saying. But imagine if we were able to apply exponential thinking principles to who we are, how we live, the decisions that we make, how we interact with people, how we impart learning to others. What if the narrative, the stories that we tell people that we are able to influence are not stories that break them down, but actually build up possibilities? Imagine if the pace of exponential technological change is outweighed by our human adaptability to anticipate, foresee, and use technology to our advantage rather than be afraid of it. What if we worked in tandem with all around us? What if we co-created the solutions for South Africa, for Africa, for some of the global crises that we are trying so hard to work on? What then would life be like? I'm gonna pause at this point, Rashika, and uh, hand to you to see if there are any questions or comments coming up in the chat. Thanks. Fantastic, Leanne, thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. It is wonderful to have you with us this evening. Um, my name is Rashka Dharat and I look after the undergraduate programs and it is wonderful to have you with us this evening. So we do want to engage with you and we want to chat with you. I want to ask for you to please type your questions um, in the chat um, below and we will try and answer them. But in the meantime, I want to do just a very, very quick recap of the key, key issues that we spoke about that really underpin our philosophy as Henley, and then sort of um, ask one or two questions of our panel. So please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box and we'll, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute or two. 
Um, Linda very, very eloquently started out by sharing something that is incredibly important for us as a continent to start thinking about, which is this concept of adult education in terms of how do adults learn? How do we actually leapfrog our continent into a space where we are in the driving seat of making sure that we can have thriving economies, thriving societies, thriving businesses, and, and, and actually be in charge of where we want to be? Um, and at Hendy, that's a big part of what we do. We spend a lot of time thinking about how do we, Linda says, we know a thing or two about learning, but we are conscious about it. And we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we best do that in our ever-changing environment, globally and locally, to make sure that we actually are thinking about how adults learn and how we can best provide leadership for, for the continent and the country. And uh, France, ever so eloquent and always so beautiful. Every single time we get to engage with you, we learn so much. And what beautiful stories this evening. So thank you very, very much for sharing. You know, but um, I, I actually want to ask a question of you. I wanted to say that as you were speaking, I was drawing so many parallels between who we are as a culture and how we actually negate a large part of our history. And if I had to ask you, you know, what would you think are the key parallels that we should draw on from our history and our culture in modern leadership? What do you think that those are and what do you think we should focus on? Oh, Rashika, that's such a wonderful question. Thank you. Firstly, collaboration. I mean, Africa is built on collaboration. That is where it comes from. When you look at the African village and how it's put together, it is entirely about working together and collaboration. It is about communities. It is about a decision making about a community and not a decision about an individual. That is what's so very important. And that's where I think our continent stands out, but where it now leads the way, because that's the way of the future, is in the, our, our, our sense of community, that we are here because of and on behalf of our communities. If you look at the Western approach, it's very much about the I. Eh? It's, it's about me making a decision about myself and the good of for myself. Whereas in Africa, we make decisions for and about a community. And that is the most beautiful value. And that is something that we should inculcate in all our businesses and everything we do. It is very much where the future is going to. It is what people are writing about, collaboration and co-creation. That is, comes for a thousands and thousands of years on our continent. And that should be at the forefront of everything we do in education. Are we considering the community? And that goes about everything eh, that we want to do today. In what we do, in the business we put together, are we considering the community? And are we collaborating? Are we doing and practicing shared value? Shared value is an ancient African concept. It's nothing new. It existed in every African village. And those are my answers to that, Rashika. I hope that helps. That is fabulous, fabulous. And you know, you're absolutely right. I mean. All cultures are embedded in, in collaboration and cohesiveness yes. and together. You know, you are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to the continent. And I wanted to ask, do you have an example or two for us where this shared value actually happens in practice? I mean, I know you've yes. traveled extensively and you, you have many, many experiences. Uh, are there one or two stories that you're able to share with us so that we can actually um, understand that from a practical perspective? There's one I would really love to share. And there's a a great friend of mine and a wonderful man called pa Father Anselm. He's a pastor as well. And Father Anselm lives in the Niger province in Nigeria. And he has a business called Pax Herbals and they export, they, manuf they manufacture, they grow uh, herbs, medicinal herbs. Now this again is our old African tradition. Hey? It's the herbs that we grow as medicine and and he is now exporting because it's a health thing as well so he's exporting to america and europe too but when he started this obviously he was growing himself and then his business exploded and he needed more product so he decided that he's going to do get the farmers around him to supply to him but he thought rather than them just being suppliers he's going to make them shareholders in the business so today he has a, about a thousand farmers in the nearby area growing herbs for Pax Herbals. 
but they are all part of the management of the company. Once a month, he has a big management meeting. All the farmers come together and they discuss the future of the business. They discuss the needs of their customers. They discuss which herbs they should maybe grow less of, which they should grow more of. And I've been very privileged that I've been there to see this. And it's absolutely this wonderful business with all these owners there, all giving input. And at the end of the day, it is the ultimate collaboration, is it not? It is about bringing your shareholders and your stakeholders into your company, of your stakeholders into your company, and then being part of the decision-making process. So he's not only made his company better, but he has also enriched all the lives of all the farmers around. They are now doing better. They are part of this business, but it is taking it back to the old concept of the African village, hey, where we all work together for the good of this company. And, and, and he consults with them all and he talks to them all and they feel free to, to add and, and to, to give their and add their knowledge to it. And it's just such a wonderful example, Rashika, of shared value, of collaboration, of doing things together for the good of a community. There you've now got a community that's empowered and enriched because of this one company, but because Father Anselm saw that it would be better if we bring all these people into the main business and they all become part of it. And to me, that is the ultimate example. The business is profitable. It's doing exceptionally well. What a wonderful story. Thank you very much for that. And you know, that's so apt. If we think about the last two years that the world has actually been through, um, everyone is reconsidering what is actually important in life. Uh, issues like our economic systems, capitalism, yes. all of these things are now being you know, thrown up in the air and rethought through and or being debated. Um, yeah. We often forget that we should actually look to, into ourselves, into our past, into our cultures to actually help us think about ways forward that are not necessarily, like you said, only from, from a Western perspective. And it's wonderful to see that we actually have examples and stories that we can learn from and utilize in, in leadership and business and practice. So, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Franz. Thanks, Rashika. And if I can just add, it is our history is rich with examples of what we can do in future. And it's about collaboration. You know, that's really what it is at the end of the day. Thank you very much. If you don't, if you don't mind me just adding in here uh, onto um, the back of what Franz is saying, is we're talking a lot about collaboration. And I think personally, it's one of the things that Henley does fairly well in its human-centered approach. And if I can just say a little bit quickly um, and deviate slightly from what we've been talking about, but just on the same point, because I fully believe France is absolutely right, is particularly in these times, people have said to us, how have we managed to carry on with all of our clients and carry on the business that we managed in 2020 and have a really successful year, albeit a sad year. And I think what we've done quite well is collaborate. And so when we have a client and provider, and if any of you are on, online, and I think Transnet might be, uh, you might attest to the fact that we are not client and provider, but we're partners. And I think that goes back to collaborating, but also not only collaborating, it brings in Leanne's view on systems thinking. And what I mentioned right at the beginning about multiple perspectives and learning socially, we learn together with our clients. And so it's not just Leanne or France or Rashika who also teaches standing up in class and spouting theories. It's actually about those exact people learning almost as much from delegates. France had a big class of retailers in class today, 35. And I'm sure if you asked him, he'd say, I actually learn things from that group. If we're not learning faster than our delegates, then we're not a business school of repute. And so I just like to back up the fact that we do like to collaborate and not only with clients, but also with individuals. So if there are any of you online this evening that would like to study independently with us, there's masses of collaboration in a human centered approach that makes sure, and part of my new role as the head of learning experience is to make sure that your experience can be as seamless as possible. We're not saying that we don't make mistakes, I'm sure that we do, but we're saying that we try and create a container of learning that allows you to feel that you're set up for success from the first day. And so it's collaboration and people-centered. Thank you, Rashika. Fabulous, thank you very much. Leanne, I wanna check, 
Um, there was a beautiful question from Valencia in, in the chat. Did you have a, a moment to have a look at it? Are you okay to, to respond to it? I'd love yeah. to hear what you think. So Valencia is asking how should corporates worldwide start to include exponential thinking? And before we even talk about exponential thinking, let's talk about what corporates, uh, and I'm generalizing hugely here, and I'll make a distinction shortly, but let's talk about what corporates are um, occupied with or preoccupied with at the moment. COVID, lockdown, profitability, taking care of their people who are going through immense mental and emotional distress, um, challenges around profitability, but also being able to cover costs and cover salaries very legitimate challenges. However, if we're always going to be firefighting, we're never gonna be able to create time to think. And in order for us to apply exponential thinking, we do need to evaluate the thinking strategies that we are applying to business strategies and follow the trajectory that we've been on. You see, if we constantly look back on the journey that we've come on and think about the trajectory that we're going to continue on, chances are it's going to be incremental changes and not exponential changes. Very often an event like COVID um, is an accelerator, but sometimes it could also be a detractor from the opportunity of applying exponential thinking. So I want to encourage organizations who are legitimately trying to firefight the challenges that COVID is presenting itself with is to also seek out the opportunities. Now, what do we mean by exponential thinking? It's the thinking that is required to fundamentally transform business as we know it, to transform relationships and relationship management, processes, systems, how we deploy, how we engage. But most importantly, I wanna pick up on something Franz talked about, and that was shared value. You see, if we're always going to be driven by profit, then we're going to be making survival-based instinctual decisions that are going to be short-term in nature and not sustainable. You see, when I think about the gamafs of the world, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, Facebook, these organizations started asking critical questions. The question typically started with what if? And the focus of the question was about solving a problem, a complex one at that. The consequence ultimately eventually would be profit, but the motive was not profit. The motive was to solve a major problem in society, in the world, in business, amongst people, amongst users. And most times it was in service of something greater. So when we th talk about exponential thinking, it may sound like a sexy term, but there has to be something more substantive in the thinking that goes into why would you want to apply exponential thinking? So to answer the question of how does an organization do this, evaluate the journey you've come on and the decisions that you've made and how you've come about making these decisions. Challenge yourself hard if you're just tweaking around the edges and doing more of the same or whether you're really challenging yourself to transform the nature of the business. Every time you see a threat, try to find the opportunity in that threat and don't settle for minimizing the threat or managing the risk and mitigating the risk associated with that threat. Seize it with both hands, take the time to think, use Francis' suggestions and Linda's too around collaborating and co-creating. I was with Dr. Eddie Obeng uh, on Monday and he said, walk towards the fear. And yes, it's scary, but walk towards it anyway because underneath that fear, underneath where that dragon is sitting, bearing fire down on you is where the treasure sits. And I think those words will always stay with me that uh, it's not gonna be an easy ride, but hey, no one said it was going to be. And for us to really challenge ourselves, Linda was talking about those new neural pathways and that's painful and that takes time to do, but it is so worth it in the end. And we need uh, leaders who are courageous enough to challenge the status quo, to come up with these new radical ideas and to start asking questions that start with what if. Fantastic, that is so much food for thought right there. Thank you very much, Leanne, that's fantastic. I wanna go back to France and I'm gonna to say to Leanne, there's a question that I think Linda put in that Junae has asked and I'm gonna ask you to, to respond to that. But before we do that, um, France, there's a question that um, Jayesh has put in for, for you specifically. Um, can you see it? Are you able to respond to it? Do you want me to read it to you? 
No, it's fine. I've seen it. Um, it's about um, how the lessons for COVID. Huh? So I think, you know, the, the the essence of the African village, and I'm going to go back to that, and when I say the African village, I mean throughout history and what is important on our continent, is, is, is about respect for each other. We, we show the utmost respect, and especially for the elderly. The elderly are revered in the African village. Hey, that, those are very important people. We don't send them off to old age homes. We keep them in the community because we learn from them and they are there to spend time with their children. If you go to any young person anywhere in, in rural South Africa or, or on the African continent and, and ask who is the most important person in your life, nine out of 10 times, they will say my grandmother. And I've tried that and you can try it too, because that is the source of knowledge and love. So yeah, so, so, so in, the, in COVID, we need to have respect for each other and for the elderly. Then we'll wear our masks. We will make sure that we adhere to the rules that will keep COVID at bay. But it's important that we see it as the community and we make the right decisions for the community about COVID. And that is why it, the, the, that history of the, of the village and, and, the, and the values of the village is so important. It will make us look after each other, tend for each other, it will make us respect each other. And therefore we will not do things like go to big raves where we spread the virus because it will harm our community. It will harm our village. And I think that is essentially what we're, we're the, the important approach lies and what, what we would have done if we were in the village and what I think we should be doing today. And those are the lessons. It's basically about respect for each other. Eh? It's basically about caring for each other and looking after each other. It's back to the doggone tribe and the relationships. Eh? It is about those. And I think that is what, what is so important that those are the lessons that the history of Africa tells us and teaches us about, about COVID. Let's respect each other. Let's look after each other. Let's make the decisions about each other. And that most certainly will, will, will help us through this pandemic. Eh? It's when, again, we make the individual decisions that we are going to be in trouble eh? when it's just about me. And I hear people saying, yeah, but it's about the fittest will survive. Eh? That's a me decision, a I decision, not a we decision. It, it, it's been an absolute revelation to hear you this evening because um, that, that's exactly the mindset that we come from in business. And I was just thinking, as you were talking about, I was thinking about this concept of black tax. And we often mm. talk about black tax as a bad thing. And that's because yes. we come from the environment. Whereas exactly. if you come from the environment, black tax is actually who we are as a culture. It's what Absolutely. we are. And we take care of each other. It, and I, and, I, and um, Don Foster Pedley, the Dean of, of Henley Business School, always says to us, that you need to look at multiple perspectives on any concept that you're looking at. And, and what you just shared now, I mean, has, has allowed me to think about black tax from multiple yeah. perspectives. Because the traditional response is, I went, I've got to pay for that auntie and that exactly. cousin, blah, 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 blah. And the reality actually is I have the privilege of being able to pay um, exactly. for, for all of those people. And that narrative is not spoken about. Yeah, and it's a privilege, Rashika, and that is our history, that is our culture on this continent. We take care of each other, and that's what our education should be all be about, and that's what our businesses should be about. You know, and, and yeah, those are the lessons we learn from, and they are beautiful lessons and beautiful, beautiful values on the African continent that I sometimes, I am very sad that we're losing some of them, you know, as we bring the more Western approach in, but beautiful, wholesome values that we can be exceptionally proud of. Fantastic, wonderful to hear. Jan, how about you? Are you ready to respond to that yeah. question? Fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. So the, uh, the question in the chat was, how do we get to um, practice the thinking skills I was referring to earlier during leadership programs through Henley Business School? And Rashika, there's several ways that we can do it. I'm just going to touch on three in the interest of time, if that's okay. And the first way we do it is through something called reflective practices. Reflective practices enable you to consider something that you've learned or consider a situation or an environment that you're in and go back and reflect. But you don't just go back and reflect. So it's not kind of, you know, a daydreaming exercise. 
it's a structured approach to how you would go back and critically analyze uh, that situation that you found yourself in. We would provide you with prompts, with triggers, with a variety of frameworks and models for you to then be able to critically analyze, to evaluate, and to also use techniques like appreciative inquiry, right? Because it's very easy to beat ourselves up when we analyze something. You know, hindsight has 20-20 vision. And we're, we're very quick to uh, criticize ourselves and punish ourselves for having made the wrong decision, not recognizing that there's learnings in these so-called failures. And reflective practice allows us to analyze this and synthesize these experiences in a way that we can grow from it, that we can come up with emerging new concepts and ideas and ways of being and new habits that can form from it that we would take forward. So reflective practice is something that is brought into our programs very strongly. The second thing is around applied learning. And so when you're applying learning, it's a matter of then planning, critically evaluating, testing something out, taking a step back to get perspective, uh, refining your approach, trying something new, and constantly evaluating your progress, right? And applied learning happens across a minimum of three contexts. Perhaps your business context, your work environment, that would be something that you would be able to take a piece of learning, apply it in the work context, uh, adjust, shift, uh, adjust again, uh, refocus, and, and continue making progress. So that could be work. What's so lovely about the Henley approach is that we welcome the whole person, the whole person. So if work isn't where you want to apply your learning and actually your family would benefit from that learning too, the tools are applicable to your family. As well as those of you that are activists in your community, these tools can then be imparted to community initiatives that can also yield greater value to others that you then pass this learning on to. And then the third and final one that I just wanna to touch on is what we call complex problem solving. It's an opportunity for you to apply your learning. Some of the clients that come into Henley want to solve an internal business problem. Some of them want to solve a problem related to the business, but that would benefit their supply chain. So their suppliers and their customers as well. Other organizations that come in, um, have different levels of programs with, with Henley. And some of these programs focus on an internal problem that they want to solve. But some of these programs want to solve a community problem. And so they bring in their leaders into these programs to learn these tools, to learn these different thinking techniques that they can then take out into the communities. Because again, to Francis' point around a shared value model, if we can change the ecosystem in which we are living and working, then that's going to have an exponential change in the success of all of its component players. And so there are ample, not just opportunities, the three opportunities I shared, but there are also in numerous contexts in which you can apply those skills and that learning. And all the way through, you are supported by faculty members, by program directors who are with you every step of the way. And some programs go so far as to also um, bring on coaches to support you on that journey so that you are completely um, supported through that journey. Thanks, Raj. Thanks, thanks, Jay, and fabulous. Today, thank you very much for your wonderful comment. And I see uh, Teke Marcola has asked a beautiful, beautiful, very loaded question. There's a lot going on in that question. Um, and, and because there's, there's so much in that, and it's such a, such an, um, a valuable question, I actually am going to ask all three of our members um, to actually respond to that as part of your concluding statements. Uh, we have, I think, about eight minutes left. So um, in, in response to, to Teka's question, um, please um, speak about it from, from the angle that you've been talking earlier today. Um, and then I think also share your concluding comments as well. Linda, are you, are you comfortable if we start with you? Sure, thanks, Rashika. So when I was reading uh, the question, my mind immediately went to Desmond Tutu, uh, whom I've had the pleasure of working with in my lifetime. And on my wall in my office, which I haven't seen for a year <laughs> due to being locked down in Cape Town, I have a statement that says, don't raise your voice, raise the level of your argument. And I think my first thought on this very, imp very important question, Seke, is that I think something that we do do as business schools across the continent 
is try and debate the heavy stuff. Our dean and people I used to work with at UCT in, in my previous place of employment was, they used to say, if you can't debate these kinds of things at a, at a university, where can you? And so I think we do have meaningful conversations. Sorry, Cashel, she's asking um, if we can re repeat the question. The question is, um, how realistic, sorry, let's just go back to that. How realistic is it though to instill this Africanism in this westernized world that's capitalistic and competitive led predominantly by greedy and self-serving politicians? Where would the starting point be for the optimists? I think the starting point would be with you, with each person. Um, we often talk at Henley about the power of one, which I've noticed in my lifetime and I've been around the block a couple of times. We often think that one person can't do it until you look at the one person that can. You might not appreciate Greta Thunberg or you might look at what she's managed to do. And I'm a, very aware, I'm, I'm not naive to what goes on around us in terms of, of the, the geopolitical situation on the continent. The other thing that I'd like to bring your attention to is Henley has a whole lot of movements that we talk about. We don't just talk about content. We talk about hashtag corporate activism, which you might have seen in the media. We talk about hashtag no more bribes. Uh, we gave Pravin Gordon um, an honorary doctorate a couple of years ago, and together with him, we started a movement um, to engage activists. So let's hear your voice, which is why this question is a beautiful one to be asked this evening. And I'm not going to say much more, but just those little thoughts, one data base, arguments on on data that is correct not fake stuff and elevate i think what i'd like to suggest that we do well at henley is we help you raise the level of your argument through increasing a level of critical thinking and so if i can critique things instead of taking them at face value and instead of just listening to some politician mouthing off about his or her um, agenda to think very critically about what sits behind the words and the only way we can do that is by actually learning how to construct an argument. And I think that's what I'd like to say. And just thank you everybody for logging on this evening. I'm aware that people are tired after a day on sessions, but I appreciate it. And obviously you can chat to us um, beyond this event uh, in terms of executive education at Henley. Thank you everybody. And over to the next panelist. Thank you very much. Leanne, let's hear from you. Rashika, I just want to remind folks that there was never a time in history when greed and corruption did not exist. Never a time. For all the time that history has been documented and recorded, whichever continent you choose to read the history books on, there has never been a time of so-called peace and tranquility. Never, not once. And while that does not excuse corruption and greed and self-serving interests, and I'm not excusing that or condoning that behavior by any means, but I am encouraging people to ask themselves one thought. When last did you think a new thought? Because when you think a new thought and you allow yourself to think a new thought, the filter through which you view the world changes. The lens through which you view the world changes. What's different between then and now is we have media and we have social media that are amplifying these bad news stories because that's where readership goes up, that's where advertising costs uh, have a return on investment, and that's where popularity ratings go through the roof, but that is not what is affecting change. What truly affects change is our ability to think, ask different questions, and take action. Thanks, I know we're out of time, I'll keep it short. Thank you so much, I appreciate that, thank you very much. Franz, over to you. We know today, and, and modern thinking and the greatest thinkers and the greatest business leaders tell us, to have a sustainably successful business, it has to be, there has to be collaboration with the businesses and the people and the societies around you. We also know that for a business to be successful, the society and the community in which it operates has to be successful. Otherwise, its success will end. We know and understand that the most successful businesses today are inclusive and share information. And that is what Africa and old Africa teaches us. It says all of that. And it said that a thousand years ago. So Africanism is nothing new. And it is also nothing that is alien to what we are thinking today. It just emphasizes to us the importance of inclusivity, 
of collaboration, of information sharing, of caring for each other, of making our community strong in order for our businesses to be strong, shared value. And that's all it says. So Africanism is not something new we're putting in, or it's not something different. It is what the, what the biggest and most successful businesses are already doing. It is simply reinforcing that. And that is why it's so important. And that is why it's so important that we recognize the contribution of our continent to what is today being seen as the important factors of making our businesses successful. And that's all we're doing. So it's nothing new. We are just taking good concepts and we are saying we have been practicing those for centuries on our continent. And that's why it's also such a beautiful concept. And that's all from me. And thank you for everybody that's here and listening to us. And I must just add, we do offer some extraordinary and great programs at Henley that I'm very, and we're all very proud to be part of. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. So there you have it, everybody. Thank you so much for spending this hour with us. We are very cognizant of your time and we are very grateful that you choose to spend your time with us. And we hope that we've um, been able to have a fantastic conversation with you about our handy ethos, about how we think about learning, about how we want our country and our continents to be relevant um, as we move into the new world of work, as we think about what our futures need to be about. And we ask those hard questions about how do we remain the optimist in a country that is riddled with a lot of grief and difficulty and corruption and all the other things that's going on. Um, it is hard but we must, we must do it and we must still do it well. And that's a big part of who we are and how we want to hold each other together to make sure even though it's difficult, what do we still do so that we can learn and we can lead as a collective. So um, on behalf of myself and everybody else in the room, um, part of the panel, thank you very much for joining us. It was wonderful to have you. Take care, have a great evening and we hope to see you soon at Henley again. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care.